just going to make a start in 30 seconds, so get yourselves comfortable now, and please do move down, those of you trying to hide at the back. <laughs> no one's going to be low. Right, and I know it's going to be low. Not quite sure which mic is going to work, but maybe you'll get me coming through all the mics. Wouldn't that be great? Hmm? Thank you, everyone, for coming along um, to this session today here at the gathering. I hope you've been having a really good time, those of you who've been able to um, attend yesterday and also this morning. I'm biased, but we've got the best session of the gathering about to happen <laughs> now, right? <laughs> yes, see? It's good to see people agree with that. And I'm just going to spend a bit of time just giving you a bit of background to the session and introducing you to the panel. And um, then we're going to go on to hear from Jess at Lankelly Chase for about five minutes. The panel will have some reflections on that and then we'll open it up to begin to have a conversation with you all. So I'm really, really pleased to be joined by Jess Cordingly, who is the Director of Transition at Lankelly Chase. Zandra Yeaman, I hope I've pronounced your second name right, who is a Curator of Discomfort at the Hunterian University of Glasgow. Ewan Aitkin, Chief Executive Officer of Cyrenians. Alan Farmer, who's the Head of Place at Cora Foundation. And Charlotte Bray, who's the Trusts and Foundations Manager for Scotland at the Dogs Trust. So a real range, diverse range of speakers with different backgrounds who may have different perspectives and thoughts on what we're going to be hearing today. Now, Lankelly Chase is a charitable foundation. Many of you will have heard of them, and they've been distributing grants for over 60 years. And it's been shifting its focus from addressing the problems caused by injustice to looking to see how we can address the causes of injustice. And the board decided just earlier this year, was it? Last year. Last year that they could no longer operate following the traditional philanthropy model. And over the next five years, they were going to dismantle and close down Lankelly Chase and distribute all of their assets, including the endowments and the resources. The decisions the organizations and the boards reach as they grapple with the colonial history of this nation and peoples may well be different for each of us, but we are connected in the here and now with the social, climate, and economic crises and increasing injustices that we're seeing in this country and globally, and we're seeing how they're playing out in our communities. And you know, we have shifted relationships between funders and organizations in receipt of funding before. We did it very quickly in some ways during the COVID crisis, when funds were unrestricted, and the trust was there that organisations would work to do the best for the communities they're in and they work alongside. So it's not like this is the impossible and it's not like there's one answer to this. There will be a number of journeys, a number of ways we can do it. And I think what we're keen to hear more about is not the decision that was made, but the process. How was it made? The impact? And what does it mean for Lankelly Chase as it goes forward? So I'm now going to head, hand over to Jess, who's going to take us through some of that journey and the factors which they considered on that journey. So Jess, over to you. Do a little dance around. Each I know. There we go. Try not to trip over wires on each other. feel like I'm giving a lecture, slightly <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> um, thank you for joining today. Um, it, it feels slightly remarkable um, to be standing here and, and, and having this conversation with you all. So I really appreciate you um, joining um, this conversation. I think I wanted to start with a, a disclaimer, um, which is that I can't give you the definitive take on Lan Kelly Chase's story. Um, and I mean, that's really because there is no one single definitive take. There is no one story. Um, our audience, I'm uh, oh, sorry, my notes scribbled here, you can see I'm reading. Um, our story is woven into and is part of the stories of many people on this panel 
um, many people in this audience, and of course the wider community. We are all part of communities. And I cannot and won't try and represent all of these different stories. So I'm just going to share my perspective to open this. Um, and I really look forward to hearing all of yours. Um, Satwa asked me to share how Lang Kelly arrived at our decision to redistribute all of our assets and the decision making over those assets. Um, over the next it's four and a half years we've got left, so the clock is ticking. Um, fundamentally, it came down to three contradictions in our work that we just couldn't escape. So the first was who holds the money versus who does the work in social justice. The second is how the, charita how the charitable money is spent versus how it is invested. And the third is, and they're all quite big, but possibly the biggie, charity versus justice. And we'd spent over a decade trying to be the best philanthropist we could be. We were so alive to these contradictions, and we really believed that we could improve and adapt ourselves out of them. Some of the key things that we did on, over this decade was we built long-term learning relationships with partners on the ground, including partners on this panel. We provided them with core funding, and we embarked on a mutual inquiry where we all had the freedom, we hoped, to question and learn and adapt together. We innovated with funding itself, um, so we learned how to fund not just regulated charities, but also movements groups of individuals, local authority innovators within um, statutory agencies, and of course, community activists. And we use different funding models from fiscal hosting to learning how to fund individuals and uh, many more. And we changed ourselves. We changed our governance model to bring decision makers from board level, decision making first from board level, then down to the staff, and then further to communities through participatory grant making and a whole host of other different methods. And so large parts of Lankelly Chase's budget is actually decided at community level now. And these were all great things and things that we really do hope other funders try and, and we encourage them to do this as well. And they improved our model of philanthropy. We really think they did. But they probably didn't touch those central contradictions. Devolving decisions to community through participatory grant making is brilliant and moves money closer to those doing the work. But it's still a charity model and not a justice one. It's still Lang Kelly holding the ultimate decision making power and inviting people in. Our money is still invested in extractive capital markets. As part of our work to change our governance model, um, just before the pandemic, so kind of 2019, 2020, Lankelly totally changed its board of trustees. <coughs> um, and our board is now staffed by exceptional individuals. The previous board, by the way, I should say, were also exceptional individuals. But this, <laughs> <laughs> in case any of you are here and many friends. Um, but these, this current group, um, all have deep lived and learned experience of systems of oppression. And, this, and it was this board that really was the kind of final factor um, in our change. So from their position of being deeply accountable beyond Langkelly Chase to broader communities also experiencing oppression and being active in different ways to, to challenge this, they could see what potentially the staff, me included, were finding hard to see which is that we could never improve our ways out of these contradictions because they are in philanthropy's DNA. They are philanthropy. And so for us, with this realization, it means that our position is untenable. There are other more effective ways of funding social justice work, we think. And we are redistributing our assets, our knowledge, our networks, our, our people and our endowment to help these ways develop. And I'll finish by saying that we're not suggesting that all funders should do the same as Lang Kelly Chase and redistribute everything. But we do think that we all need to know that these contradictions exist and, and we can't ignore them. As a sector, we need to, to see them, to acknowledge them, to grapple with them, and to find answers to the real questions that they pose. And this is our answer. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Jess. There was so much in that. There are so many things I want to ask you, but I'm not going to use Chair's prerogative to take up the whole session. I'm going to come to each of our panellists first, just for a couple of minutes of reflections of what you've heard, and then we'll open it up for comments and questions from the floor and hope to have a conversation. Um, not just about what Lan Kelly Chase have done, but how things are in Scotland, what types of changes we'd want to be seeing here, full stop, etc. So I'm going to start off by going to Charlotte first. <laughs> I was worried you'd say that. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Sorry, I'd introduced this way, so I thought I'll go this way. Uh, that's completely thrown me. Um, <laughs> so Jess, thank you so much for coming for a start. It's amazing to have somebody like Lan Kelly Chase talking about the decision so openly as well. Um, I'm going to take two elements from your introduction. One of them, you said it's still ultimately Elan Kelly Chase holding the decision-making power and inviting other people in. And the second is about the money still being invested in extractive capital markets. I'm going to take them in reverse order, if that's OK. So I'm a Trust and Foundations Manager for Dogs Trust, but I've worked for the last couple of decades for a lot of different organisations in Scotland, um, primarily as Trust and Foundations fundraiser, but also I've worked with corporate and individual giving. And I think this just, just shows maybe a little bit of, um, it, it's not laziness, but in, in trusts and foundations, I've always tended to think that um, the job of ethical fundraising has been done for me. So if a foundation sits on Oscar, or it sits with a charity commission, that's great. You know, that money is, is pure philanthropy. And now we're starting to see through decisions like this that there's nothing, there is no such thing. There's nothing pure about philanthropy, uh, however good the will is behind it. And, and so I think that's a really interesting conversation to have opened up. Um, I, having worked with corporates and individuals before, we're always used to going in and doing sort of due diligence and thinking, well, what's the return on investment in terms of what my charity is going to give in return for the money? or where the money has originally come from and how does that impact our charitable vision. And maybe thinking about it a little bit less with trusts and foundations. So that's, I think, a bit of a call to my sector and my area of work to be as diligent with that form of fundraising and to open up these conversations with funders like you uh, to, to reach those kind of decisions. Um, yeah, it feels like a really new area, therefore, to us to look at that. Um, what if philanthropy itself... It, is flawed. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting idea, isn't it? We think about that kind of gift exchange versus pure philanthropy idea. You know, at one end you've got sales where you get something in return or somebody is getting something in return for their money and you think of philanthropy as just being a, a purely generous gift on behalf of someone to someone else to do something amazing with. But there, there's that power dynamic in there which is a very uncomfortable conversation. I think it's, it's going the right way with these conversations between funders and fundraisers being a lot more open as today and these sort of conferences are an example of that. But it, it still is an imbalance. You know, ultimately mm -hmm. we're still asking for money and you guys are still holding it. <laughs> I've no idea what the answer is to that. Um, thought it through, social enterprise is great. It's not open to all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, sales isn't open to all of us. So I think your decision is very brave. It's very right. Um, it, it's terrifying. Um, I, I won't say that I'm not worried that other people will also follow suit and we'll be in a very, very different stage, but um, I'm really interested to see the direction that it's taking. So thanks for opening the conversation for us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to move straight on to you, Alan. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sir. Thank you, Jess. Um, I mean, I guess some of Cora's story and the people and communities that we've been working alongside since about 2015 are woven into some of what Jess has just, just shared. Um, for me, Lan Kelly's acknowledgement of the, the contradictions within philanthropy, within mm -hmm. civic society, the shared learning and the thought process behind the decision, those are really welcome contributions. I'm, I'm really excited to see what emerges over the coming years as, as the journey along that transition pathway progresses, recognising that you know, um, the, the destination might be clear, but actually what that looks like and some mm -hmm. of the uncertainty that we need to collectively sit with and work through. Um, particularly interested to see what emerges in terms of collectively imagining how wealth, capital and resources can flow with ease to communities. Mm -hmm. What new and non-extractive financial models might start to emerge and also what new community infrastructure and decision-making mechanisms might need to happen. So 
back in 2014, the catalyst for Cora's place-based work was a recognition that um, our funding and those from other trusts and foundations wasn't reaching all communities and that we would need to do something different in terms of how our power, wealth and resources were used. We've been really fortunate to work with amazing people and communities over that time and also fortunate to work with Anne Kelly from the outset of the work. And as other funders, strategic and funding priorities have shifted. Lan Kelly's commitment has been shared with Cora to work with, invest in and learn alongside those communities in a long-term relational way. Seven years into the work, there's real emerging um, community leadership. There's real growing community participation. There's a much stronger sense of voice um, from communities connecting in with and influencing and informing how local and, and wider decisions are made and how resources are allocated. It gives me real hope that that, and, and recognise that those are actually really key conditions, I think, if the long-term resourcing in different ways um, for, for, for communities is going to be achieved. Those, those are the kind of uh, foundations that, that, are, that are essential. And I think the decision and the conversations more broadly have you know, surfaced some really <coughs> interesting tensions. Cora occupies, I think, quite a dynamic space. It requires us to hold some, um, some of those creative tensions. So we're both a funder and a funded organisation. We hold power, we try to acknowledge that, and we try to encourage others to share power more equitably. We work within existing systems whilst also trying to kind of collectively imagine and build better ones for the future. We know long-term funding um, in new ways is required, and I think we're quite good at supporting that, but also recognise that we and other funders are not all there yet. Um, and I suppose also our, our investments are ethically invested and carefully managed, but those are still within you know, existing mainstream mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. markets. So, yeah, the, the, the decision, the, the conversations that it sparked with colleagues at Cora and more widely, and, and today um, I'm looking forward to being part of. I could go on, um, <laughs> but I won't. Um, I think the important thing is, is to hear from a range of perspectives. But those were the immediate um, reflections that came to mind for me. Thank you. There is so much already that's come out of what we've heard from the first of the two panellists, which is going to be enriched even more by the two panellists we've got left. And then, Jess, if it's OK, I'll come to you if there's any reflections on what you've heard, and then we can open it out. So, Sandra, over to you. OK, thanks, Sandra. And, um, Charlotte and Alan, just to add to that, um, I mean, Jess, I'm still processing it. Mm -hmm. So I'm still reflecting and still um, moving from one side to the other, thinking, hmm, is this good, is it bad? What, what is it? And I really don't know, but um, I like the idea of what you said about thinking about a justice model and what that would look like. And I think over the next five years, some of the work that you're going to do is going to enable us all to think about, well, what does that you know, that justice model look like. But what I think is really great is, and we were kind of briefly talking about it earlier, and the two things I want to put forward, particularly as creator of discomfort, I suppose, is one, I think it's a call to action, and I'm going to talk about why I think that. And secondly, I also think it's a provocation for the third sector mm -hmm. and others um, when we think about philanthropy and also mm -hmm. um, think about funding. And if we think about the models that we currently see within funding and philanthropy, they are actually, you're going to hate me saying this, they are hangovers for, um, from empire colonial, colonialism and the enslavement of African people. And I know that people think that's a giant leap, but it really isn't. Um, but the call to action made me think about Audre Lorde. Um, in 1979, she talked about the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And what she, she was doing at that point was speaking about racism and homophobia that exists within feminism. And this was at, at a conference. And so that was the kind of reflection. I thought that's the thesis of what's going on here. But what she was doing was a call to action. And to, to think about what um, Audre Lorde was saying, you know, for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. 
They may allow us to temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And my understanding of Blank Haley Chase Foundation was about looking at structures, about looking about genuine um, change. Um, and the issue here is that this fact is only threatening to those who still define the master's house as their only choice mm -hmm. um, of, of source of support. So we need to pause and really think about what that is. And, and you know, one of the things I remember, particularly working in the third sector, you know, a lot of, a lot of the third sector was social movements. That's how they started, was the social movements. And then what happens is we start accessing funding from governments and others, and then it becomes more and more difficult for us, you know, that term, bite the hand that feeds you. Mm -hmm. So it becomes much more difficult to be able to challenge um, and challenge those structures because of who funds us. So it, it, it's really difficult. But we also have to remember that there is real deep, fundamental need for for sticky plaster mm -hmm. you know like that sticky plaster where there's immediate need and support needed for people who are you know oppressed daily um, and some of these um, organizations who would access funding you know from whoever in Scotland are doing some great grassroots immediate work what doesn't seem to happen which is sad is connecting that with those organisations that are actually doing structural change, you know, the whole social policy. So this is the call to action that I think you're doing um, for us all to pause and think about funding um, what, what we use it for. And here's the provocation. Um, I want to leave particularly the charity sector leadership. I want to leave with this provocation. Are you promoting an idea to get space around the table for personal enrichment? Or are you promoting an idea to overturn the table and build something new to address unequal destructive power systems? We leave it there. Thank <coughs> you. And what a place to leave it. Yeah, thanks for that. I was going to say, <laughs> Mic drop. on to you. Brilliant. Great stuff. You will follow that, which I'm sure you will. <clears throat> well, I suppose I would. Uh, yeah, first of all, thanks. That, that was that, that was great, and uh, you all, all three managed to nick most of what I was going to say. So, thank you for that as well. That was brilliant. But you actually probably said it better than I would. Um, so, when we first heard about this, of course, you had the reaction was, "They've done what? Why? What are going to do? What does that mean?" <coughs> and all those those reactions. So, the, that was the first stage of provocation, you know. And that was a good thing in itself, because you may say, well, why would they do this? Because we know you. Mm. We've had relationships with you for years and really productive ones. And so we thought we understood you. But actually, we understood the idea of you yeah. rather than understanding you yourselves. Mm. And that was the first thing we had to make sense of. Mm. And we'd built an image of Lang Kelly Tish that wasn't inaccurate. Um, and it was true in the sense that it was our experience at that point. But you were saying, actually, we want to see you different. We want you to see us differently. We want a different type of conversation. And that requires us to change as well as, as you. Yeah. And I think that's the first challenge on the journey is, well, I, I'm, I'm no longer can take the thing that I am, the way I saw myself now, into that conversation. I need to ask questions of myself. Because if you're asking justice questions, we need to be doing the mm -hmm. same. I mean, you know, we, we had an incredibly long relationship with you in terms of funding our assertive outreach. Um, and, you know, staff there really getting, living out that thing where, you know, we'd staff would say, um, <clears throat> and you gave us the freedom to do this, which was mm. just phenomenal. We say, I don't know what my objectives are until I meet the person I'm mm. going to support. And then once they've worked out what yep. they want to do today, that is what we will do. Mm. And they will do, I will do what it is they, they want me to do so yep. that they can decide how they receive the help they want. Mm. And that, that's... Yeah. Phenomenal, and we really worked hard on that and built that to try to build that through our organisation, and that came from that, that relationship, and that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure it's still turned over the table, to be absolutely no. honest. If you, if you think about it, it maybe nudged it a bit or reset it, and that's all good stuff, because I don't think we should beat ourselves up about this, but we do need to be prepared to ask questions, and that's really what you've asked us to do, not ask so much questions of yourself or, or, or of Lang Kelly Chase, ask questions of us. And, you know, you funded us through, through COVID to, to, to create a video and, and photographic um, living diary mm. for our outreach staff 
who during the first lockdown were walking about, they were only people in the streets. Mm, mm. Uh, and it, just extraordinary to see the streets differently from them, but then also say, so how does this feel for the folk that we've been supporting over the years and, mm. and, and so on? And, and again, it was, let's try and see things differently. And we were having a space to do, and we were in a position to do that because of the things you, 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 you had done for us, but you still are asking more questions of us. And I think that's the really scary and exciting thing that we're, 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 we're getting into. The, the question is, how far are we willing to go? Mm -hmm. I, I have, over the years, um, t usually taken the, the General Booth approach to fundraising, which is, give me, he was the founder of the Salvation Army, give me dirty money and I'll make it clean. Mm. So it's not what it came for, it's what you do with it. Now, that's mm. partly because I'm mm. largely a pragmatist, um, and, uh, you know, that's just, that's who I am. I'm now having to ask questions about that too. Um, I, because we need to be saying, is it in, in, in working for what we would see as building justice, perpetuating an injustice mm -hmm. means that that's no longer of yeah. value? Or yeah. what is the value judgment between those two things? Um, <clears throat> and that thing about capital, we've just taken investment of, of 8 million quid um, that's being invested by folk who are doing ethical investment and a bond to buy 30 houses in Edinburgh, literally. I mean, we're literally getting keys for them to today for women who experience domestic abuse because the market in, the housing market in Edinburgh is short to bits. Absolutely. That's the politest way I can call it. And uh, we need to do something. And it's the, we've got the stick and plaster thing. And so we've got this. And because that's funded in such a way, I could take the risk of doing it because they're dealing with the money and I'm dealing with the support. And that works for us. And that is philanthropist doing capital different. And we're um, able to do something we wouldn't do before. But how deeply have I dug into that? And am I perpetuating the system at the same time as providing a response to a real need right now? And those are those contradictions that we need to be prepared to dig into. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and it will leave us with a lot of uncertainty mm -hmm. and ambiguity. And we're not very good at that. We like certainty. We need to know where we're going. And I think we're, one of the things we're really going to have to learn with the, on, on this journey is to live with uncertainty. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think many of us find it that, the biggest discomfort of all. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a journey started without a destination <coughs> known, isn't it? And that is quite... Um, challenging. Thank you for that from the panellists. I thought that was a really interesting range of views and perspectives we've got there in terms of some of the uncertainty created around if a similar journey is embarked on by others, what does it mean for those of us who are still involved in trying to provide sticking plasters? How important it is to work with the issues affecting communities in the here and now and do what we can at the same time as looking to see how we can work towards that structural change that's going to mean those situations won't arise for the families and the people we're working with now. There were challenges presented to us as third sector organisations about where do we take our money from and what do we do? And do we do money laundering or not? <laughs> <laughs> Love that phrase. Challenges to funders mm -hmm. about how far are you prepared to go we all know the language of co-production, we all know the language of co-design, we all know the language of power sharing, but are we doing it and are we prepared to do it? And do we know that that's going to create a situation where, and I don't know another way of putting this, those who've been winning up until now may start to lose out because this is about shifting the balance. It's about addressing injustices. You know, that's discomfort. How do we live with that and what do we do about that? And I could go on, there was so much in what you said, but I do think there is something about what is the future for philanthropy. I mean, the very origins of philanthropy, as you said, Sandra, where they came from, aligned with the fact that they, they, they arose at the time of industrial capitalism as well. It was a way of people making loads of money, make sure that they had the workforce they needed, fed, and just healthy enough to carry on working for them. So there were all these things that we consider that history is behind us and shapes the way things are now, but it shouldn't shape how things are. That's for us to use history differently in the ways Andrew's described <coughs> to be able to move on. So that's what I've taken from it as some of the key points. 
And I'll just hand over to you now. I'll show you the time as well. Oh, my, we haven't got long left. Right, you've got oh, two minutes quick. then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't have a watch. This is my timekeeper. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll be super yeah. quick. Yeah. Because let's open it up. Um, and it was just, it was like, just to thank you. Um, um, to note a couple of things I think I missed is that one, I want to make sure that I, I, I cite fully the different people and thinkers who have influenced us, and several came up here, one being the people we have worked with, so Oscar and his asking of questions, the outreach worker who um, you had mentioned, asked those same questions to us that he asked to the people who were uh, experiencing homelessness. He was as forensic in his questions to us always, and I have sat there with him while he asked me every question, and it is... Oscar and the, 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 the privilege we've had, these different people we've worked with, who challenged us and provided us accountability. So I really must credit them as, as we, we couldn't see ourselves and they helped us too. Um, and then also you, you picked up Audrey Lord and, and these thinkers who have shaped, the, the, the master's tools and master's house has driven this, it, it has shaped us. Um, and um, we have for a long time, ha we've got that up in our office and we've thought about it and thought like, can we, we, we are still using the same tools, but we thought it would be okay. Um, and, and we also applied it out in the sector, and maybe not so much on ourselves. We were like, well, we need systems change, and everyone's got to do changing, but we didn't look quite at what that meant for ourselves. Um, and I have to credit that we have um, some friends, I think called the Transition Resource Circle, and they've talked about the ontological shift needed, um, which is still a, a, a phrase I don't feel entirely comfortable <laughs> saying. Um, it sounds incredibly grand, but just the total shift mm -hmm. that is needed to create something different. And that's what we are now trying to embody and embody fully, which means a total shift in who we are and how we are in every way. Um, in order to allow something new to emerge. Um, we cannot, we, we don't think we can build it from what is already here. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just pick up on that point about potential for harm and the mm -hmm. important work that we talk about sticking plasters as though they don't matter, yes. when in fact they're what's holding everything together. Um, and we are deeply aware of the potential for harm of Lang Kelly Chase ending. That is something that has been said to us by many of the mm -hmm. partners we've worked with, like, well, what's going to happen to us? And there, there probably isn't a satisfying answer other than to say we, we are aware of that. We know that we are, we are trying to provide, do this as carefully with a time frame as much as possible to provide support. And at some point we have to be raising that question of why is this all held together with sticking plasters? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and to do that in the most careful way possible, but to say there is something about the resourcing of social justice that isn't working Absolutely. Here, and the money needs to flow better. Um, and then finally, just to note, I, I hope that's evident, but to note the, the privilege that we are aware we've had to, to turn that table over. Yeah. Like, so many people are doing such vital work and they are not in a position to turn that table over because they do not mm -hmm. have the privilege that we have. Um, but that makes it even more important, I think, for me that we do. Um, because what is there to stop us? Yeah. So, um, yeah, just noting that. No, oh, that's really helpful. Privilege and voice and how we use that as well in those spaces. Absolutely. Thank you. Right, we're now going to open it up to the floor for contributions and questions. When you're asking a question, can you also just say who it's directed to on the panel, please? Thank you. Susan, you've got your hand up first. <coughs> Thanks very much, that was really interesting. So this is for Jess. I was just wondering how much of your vision of where your assets are going to be in five years' time you have already, and if you could maybe give us some practical examples of that, and also how you're going to ensure a legacy for Lang Kelly Chase out of this. You know, how are you going to ensure that what you do over the next five years is remembered if other funders don't follow suit, and that, that we as a society and a sector learn from it? Thank you. Can we just take one or two more from the floor? Hi, it's Pauline Hinchin. I think, um, thinking about philanthropy and the third sector, I'd just be interested to know the panel's views of where's the public state in this? Where is public 
services and paying of taxes mm -hmm. by philanthropists and others. Yes. Because at the end of the day, we are the sticking plaster. We do ameliorate the failures of the state. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I suppose, I'd like to see that we're not just looking inwardly too much to mm -hmm. say, you know, we've tried to do it, we couldn't do it without actually recognizing that there's other actors that actually need to be there if we're going to produce systemic change. Thank you. We'll take one more. There's someone just over there. Thank you. Um, hi, and thank you. This has been really interesting. Um, I'm Juliette Swan from Transparency International UK. And following on from that, I think um, a sticking plaster for failures of the state, I think, is a really interesting way to describe it. And I guess the work that we do is very much about trying to reconfigure those structures but that's really hard to get money for because you don't, can't show a community impact. And I guess I'd be interested in anyone from the panel's reflections on that. How do we, what does systems change look like when you can't necessarily point to a person and say their life has changed because of this? Thank you. Thank you. Really interesting questions, all of them, and quite challenging ones as well. So we have two to the whole panel around philanthropy in the third sector. What about the other actors? Um, what about the role of public services and people paying their taxes or corporations paying their taxes? And a second one about when, you're when your work is around structural change and re reconfiguring structures, and it, how can you show the impact Act, or, more to the point, why should you have to show the impact in the same way as you expect from service provision? And then there was one for you, Jess, about whether you've got part of a vision already um, or whether it's a completely blank sheet for, and how you'll maintain a legacy if you choose to, as Lan Kelly Chase. So do you want to answer that one first? Because that's quite specific and then we'll open the others up to the panel. Yeah, sure, and that'll be quick. Uh, legacy uh, is crucial, it's critical. Um, we're just starting to work on this and it's the um, real focus for the next 12 months of a whole lot of our staff is around, um, part of the redistribution is not just our endowment, um, but I mentioned our, our skills and knowledge. And so we see, we're looking at this uh, next year as a real moment of accountability to all the people that we've worked with and beyond the different communities about a huge asset transfer of knowledge. Um, and that should be the legacy, like that there is a criticism um, of many funders out there of being extractive about, about knowledge. And so this is a moment if we have done that to make sure that is paid back. And so that will be a lot of the legacy. We're also going to have things like a legacy website and stuff, but we hope they'll be on. And, and being at things like this and really trying to be part of the conversation. What comes next? We don't know. Mm. We don't have a plan for it. We are not just redistributing the endowment, but the decisions <coughs> about the endowment. The Lang Kelly Chase staff are not the ones who are going to be deciding where this goes. It is a, a process that we are starting to develop, our border holding very closely in community, genuinely shifting power. I don't know whether to use terms like co-production, but it will be decided openly, transparently through a, a process and it will not be us deciding it. So it could go in different ways. There are principles underpinning it, which we've shared and they will be guiding the process. So I think they will be in some of the outcomes, but they are just guiding the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. So on the question of where is the public state public services and taxation. Can I come to you first, Sandra, on that? I was actually more interested in answering the question about structure is really hard to get money for. <laughs> oh, fair enough, then on you go, okay? disrupt away. <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's all about structure, and I thought, uh, yeah. which also ties to that other question. I think that's a great question, mm. because that's what the third sector always talks about, and the funder is always creating the agenda, isn't it? Yep. Mm -hmm. This is where you come in. Um, and this is why that provocation about, um, you know, the leadership, about turning the, you know, are you there for, for your own self-gratification or for dismantling the table? And one of the things that I thought was interesting that picks up with what you were saying, you know, when you are someone, and I am someone, I might live a middle-class life now, 
but I can assure you, I've been through all the consultation, all the community stuff, you know, that we have to mm -hmm, do. Mm -hmm. You're a person of colour or you're working class or you've been homeless, can list the intersections off, you know. Um, what I think is really interesting is when you look at the structures and you look at those of us who've always been on the margins or outside the margins, and how we are brought in for community projects or the funder wants us to do this with the community or the funder wants whatever. Really, it's up to the third sector to challenge those structures, to challenge those funders. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. It's what we all do. We all can do it. So when I was talking about the sticky plaster, which is really important, that's about the immediate action mm -hmm. that is required for people who are right at the, you know, who are, um, beyond the margins even, you know, I mean, I think about the destitution that goes on, particularly for refugees, mm. that's, that's one for me that, you know, for the last 20 years um, had involvement in. So there is real, you know, stuff that you need that money for, but that doesn't negate us from taking the responsibility when we are employed within these organisations to address the structural power inequality. Mm. And we can all be complicit in it. And a great example of this is before the death of George Floyd, who was murdered by the police in the States, I would come to places like the gathering and I never saw any people of colour in any of the media mm, stuff, but mm, you're actually mm -hmm. seeing it now. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, I know this is uncomfortable and I'm leaning into discomfort. We have to also own, own our own compl complicity in upholding those structures. And I think that your question was absolutely brilliant because that kind of gives you an idea of where our thinking is, whether it's the third sector mm -hmm. or the public mm -hmm. sector, you know, structure is really hard to get money for. Let's sit with that. Mm. That was a conversation we were having earlier was about what it's easy to get funding for, but what they don't understand is required for yeah. systemic change, which should arise out of what we're doing on the front line and what we're seeing, but nobody wants to fund that bit. And letting people go that we like because the project's finished. I know, you know that's exactly. Really it one. is. You know, you want Absolutely. to keep someone on and then they're kept on and they're yeah. in a job that's actually they don't have the skills. Absolutely. For. We, yeah. we're, we're perpetuating this. It's very, very mm -hmm. difficult, mm -hmm. isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, but, but it's, it's the truth. It's and difficult to extract what, oneself from I would it. Say yeah. that that's what Lan Kelly Chase Foundation has actually recognised. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And it's not about who's good, who's bad, who's right, who's wrong. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hard. And as Jess said, this is their journey. Mm -hmm. We will all have different journeys. I would like us all to jump on their journey. Right? Yep, and so would I. it goes. So would I. I will goes, be talking about that at definitive. the end. Exactly. But I don't know how much time we've got left because... Quarter past nearly. Right, okay. I just, just say we so I just wanted the, to ask the, about yeah, the, the panel state, to come the in. The state thing. So the, 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 the state needs to act big because it's got a position to act big and mm -hmm. ability. So in, in housing, what should it do? In my humble opinion, it should buy up all the land. And so that removes the value, land value. So that would knacker the, um, uh, the market in a beautiful way. <laughs> um, I, and it should start building houses. This is not complicated stuff because mm -hmm. the evidence shows that, you know, the, what's the most successful yes. uh, uh, economy in the world? Uh, depends on what you define as successful. But if you take GDP as your answer, it's Singapore, 90% of the houses are owned by the state. Mm -hmm. cause, so everybody has a house that they can I afford because the state manages yeah. it. Um, whereas the other successful economies, they're in, in Finland and other places where 90% of the land is owned by uh, the state. And so developers can develop, but they develop what the state says is needed um, for the people. And they can um, and they control the, the, the points of control there. The difficulty for the, the state is us, because we don't hold them to account for those things. Yes. Yeah. Politicians, uh, where we, we have a transactional model of, poli of politics, mm. where we want to know what they did for us yeah. uh, with the money we gave them in their taxes in the last 20 minutes. So we as voters need to ask different questions of our politicians, or they will continue to do what we're asking them to do at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I speak both as a voter and a recovering politician. <laughs> <laughs> You've covered both ends of the spectrum there. Thank you very much for that. But I think that's a really important point about what responsibility we need to take for holding, holding people accountable mm -hmm. and the discomfort we then have to sit with when we're doing that mm -hmm. and the slight fear of what the imp implications might be for us as organisations. But I think if we're doing more of it collectively, then it'll be make a much bit bigger impact than 
at the moment when we see all these siloed campaigns happening. And I think what the housing charities have come together and done, particularly in Edinburgh, to get the council to, to declare a housing emergency, you know, it wouldn't have happened without that external pressure on that council. They would yeah. not have done that. Oh yeah, I can, I, yeah, absolutely. But we now get them to do something with it. Now <laughs> we have to make sure that it's nothing more than yeah. just a declaration. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But it's progress. It's progress. It's a it tipping is point. It's progress. Yeah. Alan and Charlotte, I want to give you an opportunity to come in on either of those questions sure. if there's anything you'd like to say. Do you want to go first? <laughs> sure, go on then. <laughs> um, I mean, I think uh, you, the, you have made a good point around taxation and the bigger side of things. With, with public service, you know, increasingly our work alongside communities is connecting in with um, public service. And, and there is a need mm -hmm. for, as you've said, sort of a collective resourcing, so actually t trying to think through what the future of public service looks like, but, but having that being driven by the, the voice and experience of people in the communities that, that are actually mm. you know, accessing and, and or trying to access those services. Um, I suppose there's a bit about the, the, the structures as well. So we've, the, um, Pandemic was mentioned as a way of, of you know, funding mm -hmm. moving differently, trust, resources. Mm. Um, and that did create, I think, a moment where there's an opportunity to, to continue to do things differently. But there is a prevailing sense of scarcity within um, public discourse, certainly public authorities, national government. And it's about how do we collectively um, challenge that sense of scarcity. And that's where I think some of the, the, the thought and decision making from Lan Kelly comes back in. So it's not just about um, working within the existing structures, but mm -hmm. at the same time, um, trying to actually build and demonstrate what new and improved structures might be. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, there's so much that I could say on, on <laughs> both of those points. So I'm just trying to uh, craft my thoughts slightly. I'll come first of all on the idea of structures. You're absolutely right. It is much easier to get funding for something tangible with a beginning, a middle and an end tangible KPIs and outcomes and outputs than it is for something that is longer term. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've worked for environment charities in the past, and that is very so low down on everybody else's agenda, because as much as we can see climate change, we can see that the poorest people yes. in the world are going to be the first ones mm -hmm. to suffer, but it's still so far at the back of the agenda after everything else, like you say, the sticking plaster. Uh, and the taxation thing is... A, yeah, it's really interesting. I've talked to people who work um, and, and live in other countries and they go, what's your job again? You work for a what? And I thought, it's a charity. And they go, well, well, so what does that do? And I said, well, we do this, this and this. And they said, well, doesn't your government's tax pay for that? And I'm like, well, no, funnily enough, it doesn't. Um, and you see these funders saying, oh, we're not going to fund something that should be statutory responsibility. Whereas I think increasingly it feels to me that the government is letting us take quite a lot of that slack and going, yes. right, well, we can cut the budget here because we know yeah. that yes. the, third, the third sector will step in. <laughs> we're no longer that kind of nice to have, not nice to have, but we're no longer an added extra. We're, we're fundraising for essential services now. I've got, I know people who fundraise for libraries, schools, mm -hmm. museums, mm -hmm. the NHS. Mm -hmm. and, you know, these should not be things that mm -hmm. we're fundraising Absolutely. for. These should be things that should be basically paid for by tax. Uh, so that, I, I don't know what the answer is to that, but it increasingly feels like that's going in the wrong direction. We are seeing increased competition for funding, increased targets, increased need for our work, and just less available. And it's a huge thing. So my hope is from these kind of conversations where you're like, actually, philanthropy is no longer going to do this and shouldn't be the way to do mm -hmm. it. Actually, we've got a much bigger problem to solve. Yes. We're going to have to start doing that. Yep. But will we say to a politician, I will only vote for you if you put my taxes up. Yeah. Yes. I know. I know. But some of us would. Some yeah. of us wouldn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to. I think it's another to. layer, yeah. though, and you touched on it, is about unity. Uh -huh. I mean, my experience in the third sector was very much about people being pitched against each other, Absolutely. which is again part of the master's tools. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've watched it. I've been in meetings. I've been in rooms where people are talking. Well, we'll be better than them. We'll, I mean, let's be clear here. You know. Some of you might have even been part of those conversations. We need to get to a point where we have to be clear that we're not in competition with each mm -hmm. other. You know, 
there's, there's a lack of institutional memory. I mean, I'm an activist. I've been around a long time. I have a clear memory of all the activism, particularly around anti-racism mm -hmm. and, and disability over the last 25 years. It's as if it never happened. Mm -hmm. Someone else steps in and, and they're new and they sure. know best and, and all of a sudden they're activists and they're going to take it forward. Yeah. I mean, institutional memory of the past is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And that's why we get into this situation is because they divide us, they tell us, all oh, right, that's good, that's a wee bit more palatable, we'll work with that. So we're never getting the chance to build, to build, to build that unity. Mm -hmm. And we need to build that unity because we don't even need to like each other. <laughs> it's not about us as individuals, <clears throat> it's about that collective Absolutely. liberation. It really is. Absolutely. So there is something there about our own complicity mm -hmm. in the situation that we find ourselves in. And I think just thinking about something you, Alan, that I'd spoken about the COVID stuff and the sort of, you know, the way things changed. The question I then have is, well, why did we revert back to old ways so quickly? Do you know? I don't know if anyone can answer that. This is anyone, please, if you've got an answer, I'd love to hear it. Because it happened just like that, we reverted back. I think discomfort is really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. This is the point. <laughs> like, this, you know, structural change. Yeah. I've just been reading this, this stuff, Pedro Choma. I don't know if anybody likes British teaching and thinking, but I do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she talks about idiot compassion. Yeah. You know, and, and what she's basically mean is people using compassion as a tool for control mm -hmm. because it's not real. Mm -hmm. And you can clearly see that we have gone back to that baseline, mm -hmm. but it also links to what you were saying, Ewan. You know, I was working in the College of Operational Quality Rights during the pandemic. I saw grassroots, non-constituted, you know, Absolutely. groups, you know, hit the ground running. They knew exactly what Absolutely. was needed. They knew exactly how to mobilise. No charity involvement was happening at that point. That came later. And I think sometimes the charity sector gets a wee bit uncomfortable when their power mm -hmm. is taken away like that. Mm -hmm. You know, in Glasgow anyway, it was actually grassroots individual people mm -hmm. who were mobilising for themselves because actually people outside the margins are used to uncertainty. Well, it was a mm. Charity is a construct, isn't it? Exactly, but the positives coming out of it was we saw activism mm. Mm -hmm. coming from the grassroots up. We all, you know, I sit in government rooms elsewhere, everyone talks about activism, everyone talks about this. It's almost like things that you can create, you can't. Mm. They have to come from the bottom up. It's not something that, you know, we can create I think you need so both. Government level. I think you need say. bottom up, top down. I think you need both. But they need to be met in the middle. Yeah. They, they need to meet. To and it's other. the fact at the moment what we'll have is those sitting at the top thinking it's going to happen in my way. Mm. But actually, part of the meeting in the middle is about recognising that what they did on the ground was mm. actually may have been the right way. I would have had it wrong. Mm. Okay. People don't like mm. that discomfort. I'm about to ask a question. Sorry, we're ready at the end. And I've got yeah. somebody over there with the mic. So. Last Sorry. question. Hi, my name is Duncan Dunlop, and I don't put a downer in this, but <laughs> I really struggle with this. I work with um, care experienced people, and I'm still doing a voluntary bit, and it's very embryonic, like not even a charity movement project we're describing. Yeah. We don't want money from government. We do not want it because it's a huge problem globally. And there's not one organization or a movement of care experienced people internationally that is independent of the government that holds the state to account for the failings of what's happening to, to, that popu to this population. We relied on people like Lancel and Chase to give that money. Right. And I look around, I can do Neil in front of me, lottery, gambling. Biggest funder in Scotland, Robinson Trust, whiskey. Right. William Grant, whiskey. We don't have to go far to look at, if we want to, our ethical problem with some of the funders. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking at is where do I get the money to support that group? If everyone makes the same decision that Lancel and Chase does, then I don't know how we get off the ground. Maybe that's just a restrictive thinking that we have in terms of a group where we've ordinarily got it, mm. but they don't have that money within the community to fund this themselves. Mm -hmm. That is exactly one of the yeah. things that you were saying, one of the harms that you're trying to think about, yeah. so uh, how you address that. But it's a bigger challenge than if others are going on the journey, how do we make sure that we're just not creating different inequalities mm. as a result of what we're doing? And how is that money, how yeah. is our endowment and our other resources actually transferred you know, this isn't a spend yeah. out mm -hmm. this isn't us decide not us deciding in all the ground mm -hmm. going this money should continue to exist in the sector in other, what we're saying is it shouldn't be held yes. by an institution right. uh, staffed by predominantly white middle class people based in london you know this money should still be in the sector flowing in different ways and that is the vision 
and there is a reality of, of it being a funder that is relied on and trusted by many people disappearing, mm -hmm. and that is true. So this is exactly what we're balancing at the moment and trying to do it in the most careful way. And there's a huge discomfort, and I'm sorry if you're experiencing it. Yeah. It isn't though the thing that you're, you're trying to identify those communities who could make best use of it? Yes. And the community that uh, Duncan was talking could about well yeah. could well be yeah. one of them. Absolutely. It's just they'll have a different relationship with the money. Yeah. They'll not have to ask for it, they'll have it. Yeah. Yes. You know? Yes. But you need to go on a journey to get to that to place. Get to that. Exactly. The money should still be there. Yeah. And you've started that process with a couple of organisations yeah. already. I mean, Baobab Foundation being one of them, I think they were one of the first that you've endowed yeah, and money then, to. Yeah. That was one of the. Yeah, uh, we uh, are in the process of endowing, setting up, a, supporting a, a new foundation set up, Baobab Foundation, um, uh, which is a, a black-led organisation supporting uh, black-led um, work and projects, um, and we're endowing it with eight million. So um, that is that that is one of the things that also sort of led us to mm -hmm. this point, and that's the sign of the money will continue to exist in the sector, not held by us. Thank you. We are now coming towards the end of the session, I've been told. Five minutes. I'm not going to take those five minutes up summing up because what I do want to do is for each of the panellists to leave us with their, their thought, one thought each on what we've heard so far today. And I'm going to start with you, Ewan, this time. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Uh, I could see Charlotte's look of panic uh, on her face. I was, I was just relaxing, waiting for the cover to us. <laughs> um, so this is about power mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and about understanding your own power and being willing to change. And I think the huge thing for this is how are we all going to go on a journey of change mm -hmm. here rather than how are we going to reposition ourselves to get this money in a different way, but really be the same. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's the really big challenge for us in, our, in, 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 in thinking about this um, and uh, yeah, no. really important for us to take the time to do that. Absolutely. Thank you. Sandra? Good. Um, well, I suppose I do think this is a call to action and I really respect I'd love to speak to you after actually what you said there. Um, when, you know, when you're speaking out about the impact something like this will have on a particular group that you work with. So I'll come and look for you. Um, but I do think this is a call to action. I think the charity sector is, as all sectors are, going to have to go through a change mm -hmm. of some sort. And I think the driving force of this, the change that we're going to have to get to, is that point of unity, support, value-based leadership. Um, and really understanding what equality, diversity, inclusion really, really means as outside of a kind of tick boxy yeah. drive, which is what we're pushed into. Mm -hmm. How are we going to live the change, yes. isn't it? Right, Alan? So I guess uh, the idea of a journey has, has come up a number of times and, and Cora's work, we're, you know, we're three and a half years into a, a 10 year strategy. We know what, what we think the, the destination mm -hmm. of that looks mm -hmm. like, but we don't know what some of the steps are. So certainly, as has come across through the conversation, how are we able to work with uncertainty and to support others to do that? Within the strategy, for us, there are way markers around social, racial, climate justice. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, you know, there are aspects of work and areas of focus that we recognise are really important, um, but it also, we don't know exactly what the, the answers to that are. We do know that participation, listening and working with people and communities that are closest to that will really be um, fundamental to it. And I suppose that, that goes to the point about, you know, what, what power do we have? What power are we able to give up? Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Charlotte? Gosh. Uh, yeah, quite a hard one to sum up. I really like that we're having this conversation and I hope that you're decision opens up more dialogue in this way because there is a power imbalance not only between funders and charities but between charities and the people that we support as well yes. we need to see more lived experience people in trustee roles in funder roles in fundraising roles and in working in the sector the sector itself needs to be more accessible to people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to come in to work in it to have their voice heard and to, uh, to have their experience heard and I think I really hope that this conversation will contribute to that. Activism's brilliant. It's also really hard to maintain. You saw that in COVID where 
it was fantastic and everybody had a great time and then we went back to normal so quickly. So let's just, I just hope that doesn't happen. I hope that this is a shakeup that says the power imbalance is, is not right. We need to do something about it. We need to work together to bring about justice. It's going to be a really long journey. Sorry, I have to respond to that. That's what activism is. It's about, yes. you yeah. know, you want to um, take mm -hmm. action. Yeah for social and political change. Mm -hmm. So I would like to thank pretty much everybody in this mm -hmm. room is an activist mm -hmm. of some mm -hmm. sort. It's not all about marching on the street. Mm -hmm. No, it's a real combo. And, and, and that's something- That's what activism yeah. is. But we yeah. saw, for example, we saw with the, you know, the, the environment movement was doing brilliantly until COVID hit. And then it's just stopped. So it, it, it's interesting. Can people say sustain a level of passion about something that drives- Oh, it's exhausting and it's tiring. Yeah, but it's activism tiring. isn't always that thing that people think it is yeah. mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. you know just mm -hmm. like white supremacy isn't always yeah. that thing that people sure. think it is yeah. so I think I, th I think the third sector is full of activists I think it is and I, I think, think that activists are absolutely every single day of their life absolutely. from the moment they wake up to the group absolutely bed. and then we, we need to harness it collectively yeah. now mm -hmm. don't we in terms of the big change Jess final word from you before I sum up uh thank you for having me um, uh, <laughs> thank you for, for the, the conversation. This is, mm -hmm. for Lan Kelly, this is stepping into total uncertainty. And again, noting the privilege, this is an uncertainty that a huge number of people and organizations live with every day. And I think for a funder, we're just getting a taste of what's there. Um, uh, and I am glad that we are, it feels more in solidarity now with the rest of the sector, that we are in the uncertainty together. Mm -hmm. and. I guess it's a final kind of provocation, but it's that point of we all, we, we all talk about change and we talk about the power shift that, that does need to happen in so many levels in our society. And we must turn that on ourselves to ask whether it's us that need to be moving out of the seats of the power. Absolutely, well. absolutely. And I think that's a really, really good um, point to try to close on. And I think it's something for us all to take away. What is it we're prepared to do? What is our organisations can do? and prepared to do? How do we reset some of those relationships we have with the people we work with, with the people we work alongside in the organisation? And how do we challenge those who fund and support us to reset some of those um, relationships? But you know what? It's really hard to do when you can't imagine or visualise what it's going to look like. And I think that's one of the things we could maybe look at doing something on collectively. And I'd read a quote somewhere, and I don't know who said it, I'm terrible at remembering, but it was basically, we find it easier to imagine the end of the world than we do the end of capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it's true, the world is burning around us. You know? We know what's causing it, but we're not talking about how we dismantle and end that. And I think until we get to the point where we can imagine the end of the systems we've got, which create the inequality and what it's going to look like, we always have to be there to a certain degree, mopping up um, the demand created from the failure of the state. But that that in itself isn't going to be enough for us. We have to think about how that leap is made for the structural changes that mean that those failures are no longer happening. And I think the care experience community and housing are two of the most stark examples we have about the costs of failure demand on individuals and communities. So I would just leave you with that thought about, let's try and imagine what it would look like differently. It will be different for all of us. And let's have a go at seeing how we can get there. All our individual journeys within our organizations. Thank you very much for coming and thank you to the panel. Thank you.